Good morning, and welcome to the fourth annual Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn Women's History Month Convocation in celebration of National Women's History Month at Morgan State University, where we set aside time during the month of March to acknowledge the contributions of women. My name is Dr. Ida Jones, and I'll be presiding for you this morning. The Turborg Penn Women's History Month Convocation Committee, comprised of Dr. Adele Newson Horse from the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Program, and myself from the Beulah M. Davis Special Collections Department, seek to infuse the Turborg Penn Women's History Month Convocation with the annual National Black History Theme established by the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, of which Dr. Turborg Penn belonged, participated, and was actively involved. I'd like to give special thanks to our AV team of Henry, Malik, Dexter, Thomas, and Luther, and Miss Dawn Scruggs from here in the Student Service Center. The program will be as following. A recording of Lift Every Voice and Sing with Dr. Eric Conway and the Morgan State Choir, followed by a history of the Turborg Penn Convocation Month by Miss Daria Sanar, occasion by Miss Jennifer Uma Zenwa, and introduction of our speaker by Miss Rolisha Martin, our keynote address will be Dr. Camilla Alexander, and our closing remarks will be by Dr. Phyllis Keyes, followed by the alma mater by Dr. Conway and the Morgan State University Choir. We will now have Lift Every Voice and Sing. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Dara Sinar, and I'm here today at this convocation to share a bit of history with you. In 1926, Dr. Carter G. Woodson created Negro History Week to share the accomplishments of African Americans with the world. He selected February to honor the birthdays of President Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, roughly between February 12th and February 14th. In 1976, under the U.S. President Gerald Ford, Negro History Week was renamed African American History Month. President Ford stated that all Americans would benefit from acknowledging the accomplishments of African American citizens. It is important to note that Dr. Woodson's organization, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, founded in 1915, crusaded throughout the 20th century to ensure that every citizen would know the name and work of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. In 2022, Woodson's Association continues to champion the researching, publishing, and promotion of African American history, life, and culture. Every year, the association selects a black history theme to guide targeted, a targeted discussion about African American history. The 2022 black history theme is African American health and wellness. Morgan scholars contribute to the annual activities of the association, as did our legacy faculty, such as Dr. Ta Rosalind Turbork Penn. To fast forward, Morgan State and Dr. Woodson found synergy in September of 1989 during the presidential administration of Dr. Earl S. Richardson. President Richardson instituted a year-long celebration of African American history and culture to be marked by monthly convocations at which the Morgan community reminds itself of the achievements of its past and the imperative for even greater triumphs in its future and at which it honors the great contributors to humanity. This year-long calendar from September to April consists of nine convocations. In March, Women's History Month, this convocation highlights the contributions of women. In 2019, Dr. Edwin Johnson and others proposed that the women's convocation be renamed the Ros Rosalind Turbork Penn's Women's History Month convocation. President Wilson agreed, and in 2019, the inaugural Dr. Turbord Penn Women's History Convocation was born. In brief, Dr. Turbord Penn taught at Morgan for over 35 years in the Department of History. Her research interests were African and African American women's history. Her scholarship pioneered the formation of African American women's history as a credible subfield within history. Thus, this conv convocation seeks to honor the legacy and gender-focused scholarship innovated by Dr. Turborg Penn, as well as the importance of celebrating African American history and culture as envisioned by President Richardson. In 2022, there is a special addition to our celebration, the bicentennial birthday of freedom fighter, suffragist, and humanitarian Harriet Ross Tubman. Using the life of Harriet Tubman, the gendered scholarship 
of Dr. Terborg Penn, the 2022 National Black History Theme on Health and Wellness, our keynote speaker, Dr. Alexander, will explore the effects of gender-based violence on African-American women's health and wellness. In closing, Morgan's trailblazing initiative in establishing this year-round celebration comes at a propitious moment in the university's history at a time when the student body, with the fervor and the enthusiasm of the students of the 60s and 70s, reaching out for self-knowledge and self-identity, has urged the university to teach it more about itself. The university has responded admirably. The Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program is expanding their course offerings into general education requirements for all Morgan students. In the midst of the pandemic, the convocations went viral and are now in hybrid mode. Continuing in the tra tradition of Dr. Woodson, Dr. Richardson, and Dr. Turbrook Penn. Finally, for all convocation content, please visit Morgan State's YouTube channel. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Omizenwa. I'm a student um, in the English program um, here at Morgan State University. I am here to present the occasion around the subject of African-American women health disparities at this convocation. Caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation, and that is an act of political welfare. Other Lord's words are beyond inspirational, but an actual blueprint of how African-Americans in general and African-American women in particular sought to retain ownership over their bodies, health, and wellness in concert with the Association of the Study of African-American Life and History and their Black Health and Wellness, we in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality program will utilize the 2022 Terbrook Penn Women's History Month convocation to explore Black women's health and wellness. The platform of this convocation, a hybrid, is a glaring example of how the pandemic greatly impacted physical, emotional, financial, and psychological health and wellness at our fair Morgan. Prior to the pandemic health disparities for African-American women, both cis and transgender were fraught with violence from partners, chronic disease, over-policing, malnourishing, and psychological torment. For example, the organization Our Black Girls reported, according to the National Crime Information Center of the FBI, approximately 33% of people reported missing are black, but that isn't reflective of the evening news. Lauren Smith Fields from Connecticut was found dead after an encounter with a bumble date with alleged connection to the local police department. Autopsy report found fentanyl in her system. Her case is still under investigation because her family and friends are pushing the case. In terms of maternal health disparities, African-American women are experiencing an uptick in distressed pregnancies. The Center Disease Control reported, black women are three times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause than white women. Multiple factors contribute to these disparities, such as variation in quality health, care, underlying chronic conditions, structural racism, and implicit bias. Tennis phenom Serena Williams experienced a smooth pregnancy and emergency scissoran followed by pulmonary embolism, which is a condition in which one or more arteries in the lungs becomes blocked by a blood clot. Serena noted, because of my medical history with this problem, I live in fear of this situation. So when I fell short of the breath, I didn't want, wait a second to alert the nurses. Yet, very silver lining. The agency of African-American women to care for themselves. Our enslaved ancestors utilized nature, herbs, spirituality, and other indigenous practices to stabilize themselves and create stasis within their communities and spheres of influence. The formation of the Black Women's Club's movement married indigenous and scientific practices to teach and modernize rural communities. Cultivating farms, providing immediate care, sharing workloads, they survived. In 1983, Bile Y. Avery founded National Black Women's Health Project. The lasting legacy of that conference and the organization that sprung from it is due to the empowerment of countless black women. In 2022, 
renamed the Black Women's Health Imperative. The imperative instituted aggressive national programs in health policy, education, research, knowledge, and leadership development and communications to save and extend the lives of black women. Today, in 2022, at these hybrid Tebuk Pen Women's History Month convocation, our keynote speaker, Dr. Alexander, will share from her trailblazing research on African-American women's health in Baltimore. Dr. Alexander's work continues the tradition of African-American women's agency for contemporary and future generations. Thank you. My name is Rolisha Martin. I am the retention coordinator for the School of Computer, Mathematical and Natural Sciences. Um, but I also have the distinct pleasure of introducing um, Dr. Kamala Alexander, who is a friend and mentor, research mentor to me. Dr. Kamala Alexander, Dr. Kamala A. Alexander, is an assistant professor and associate director of the PhD and postdoctoral programs at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. Her research examines the socio uh, structural determinants of trauma and violence on sexual, mental, and reproductive health outcomes among marginalized young people. As a trained advanced practice public health nurse, Dr. Alexander uses health equity and social justice lenses to examine the complex roles that intimate partner violence, HIV resilience, societal gender expectations, and economic opportunity play in the experience of intimate human relationships. She is recognized for her scientific and community engaged leadership as a member of the inaugural cohort of Betty Irene Moore Fellowships for Nurse Leaders and Innovators. Dr. Alexander has been a leader in advancing health equity in interprofessional activities and leadership roles within and outside Johns Hopkins. She is the inaugural chair of the nursing initiative of the Mid-Atlantic Center for AIDS Research, or CIFAR, consortium. Lead faculty for the violence working group at the Johns Hopkins Center for Injury Research and Policy, chair of the HIV STI committee of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, and the Associate Director of the NIH-sponsored Interdisciplinary Research and Training in Trauma and Violence T32 Training Program at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Alexander earned a BS in uh, Exercise Science from Howard University, a BSN and MSN and PH from the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing, and a PhD in nursing science from the University of Pennsylvania. Her goals are to not only promote health and prevent uh, morbidities, but to lead and create investigations that affect practice and policy on a global scale. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker for today's convocation, Dr. Kamala a. Alexander. Thank you so much for this invitation, and thank you for that introduction, Relisha. It's such a pleasure to work with you and to watch you grow as a, as a budding scientist. So good morning to everyone. I'd like to say that my pronouns are she, her, and I'm delighted to be with you all today to honor the legacy of Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn, a pioneering historian of black women's history, who through her work and activism expanded our world's knowledge about the contributions of black women to history, scholarship, and policy. So I am a nurse, a public health researcher. I'm also a parent, a spouse, and I'm an unapologetically black woman I wake up every single day excited about research and teaching that aims to eliminate all kinds of violence, particularly intimate partner and sexual violence, as well as reproductive coercion that is so common to the experiences of black women in our communities. Intimate partner violence, or IPV, includes physical, 
sexual, or psychological harm, including threats by a current or former partner. IPV affects almost one in two black women in the United States. That's compared to one in four in the general population of women in our nation. Homicide, most often at the hands of an intimate partner, is the second leading cause of death among young black women in the United States. This is a globally recognized public health problem, and it's affecting millions of people and families worldwide. It is particularly detrimental to the lives of young black women in many areas of our city, Baltimore. IPV is connected to the high rates of gun violence that are so persistent in our city. In my studies, more than one third of young black women report being coerced into pregnancy, and almost 90% report violence that includes psychological acts. So these types of violence, these types of experiences are often precursors to severe violence that is life-threatening and most often occurs among our young black women before the age of 25. So violence is pervasive. It is patterned, it is persistent, and it's rooted in a desire for power and control from one partner over another. And at first glance, this issue can be minimized as an interpersonal or family issue between two people, glaring silently at the covered ears and turned backs of those in our public sphere. In fact, it can be so pervasive that it penetrates the daily routines and the daily paths that black women must face as they traverse across our city, our states, and our country as a whole. Now many of us sitting in this room or watching this program have been touched by violence in some way, whether through an embodied personal experience or through our close networks of friends and family that we care about. So I remember as a newly minted public health nurse in the mid-2000s, I cared for many black women living with HIV or living in marginalized circumstances that presented risks to their safety and health right here in Baltimore. But the stories of two women, black women, continue to inspire my work. The first, a woman in her late 50s who was newly diagnosed with HIV, disclosed to me that she had acquired the virus as a result of sexual violence in the previous year. And while coping with this new reality, she had recently found a new loving partner. But she was so ashamed to disclose her health status to him and was even more afraid to start a new relationship. So she felt shame, she felt stigma, she felt fear as she made her way through this journey. The other story was of a young woman, young adult woman in her early 20s, who frequently came to our Title X clinic requesting pregnancy testing. She was infected with chlamydia at almost every visit she had with me. Her partner insisted that they have a baby but she couldn't negotiate her safety. She really loved him and was afraid that he would leave her. And while these stories and many countless others ignited a desire for me to understand the effects of trauma and violence on the lives of black women, as a clinician, I knew I was simply getting a snapshot into their lives. The fact that these women felt welcome in the, in the carefully curated environment that me and my colleagues had created in that clinic, they expressed a desire to discuss deeply personal experiences. And this was humbling for me. But it also made me wonder how the places that were in their daily routines and daily paths, such as their homes, their workplaces, their friendships, how that gave them support or 
hindered their protection from the violence that they had encountered. In her 2017 essay titled On Violence, Intersectionality, and Transversal Politics, Patricia Hill Collins posits that an examination of violence experienced by black women is an entry point to understand how domination is organized across multiple systems of power. Now, systems of power often operate within geographic boundaries. We can think about one aspect of geographies as the physical locations or spaces in which black women experienced violence. So for example, research demonstrates that certain neighborhood characteristics heighten incidents of IPV and are often clustered in tightly bounded communities where fewer resources exist. Research has also shown that IPV-related healthcare resources and services are geographically concentrated due to institutional processes such as zoning laws, financial drivers that designate services to areas based on profit rather than public health need, political drivers that allocate resources to areas that are deemed preferable to local leadership. There's also social processes that are historical and deeply rooted in our community, such as residential segregation, that give rise to the incidence of IPV in our communities. So this geographic spacing can severely alter the ways in which women interact with members of their communities. It can also severely change the way that they seek help from formal institutions. It can also reinforce isolation that many black women face when experiencing violence inside of their homes. But there's another aspect of geographies that we don't really talk too much about and is not in the, in the research as much. We call that place, or where women, black women, derive meanings from the physical spaces in which they are. Place is where social norms are cultivated, they're reinforced, and sometimes resisted by black women survivors. For example, in some of my more recent research with young black women queer survivors of violence, the burdens of carrying multiple marginalized identities have changed the meanings of places such as churches in our communities, their workplaces, because their sense of belonging was disrupted. Women often report that the trauma of survivorship shifted their belief in safety and, their, and support was reserved for some of their identities, but not others. Renowned social theorist Catherine McKittrick describes multiple ways that black women actively negotiate these geographies, both space and place, and that those negotiations are grounded in a legacy of violence. So she merges these concepts of space and place, calls, calling them splace, to describe how traditional geographic examinations often dislocate black women from an often complex picture. This dislocation renders black women invisible. She argues that black women do not passively absorb our environments and surroundings, but the ways that we make meaning of those spaces relates to persistent struggles against oppression and domination. She makes poignant arguments in her book, Demonic Grounds, against oppression and domination, about strategic invisibility of black pain and resistance, co-modification, black performativity as a result of multiple years of witnessing and experiencing violence. Now in the public health world, researchers have illuminated that black women survivors are resilient and they're resilient from these struggles through accounts that, and conceptualize them as, as sources of strength. Many black women draw safety from building and nurturing networks of people that care about them. They talk about engaging in self-care to foster well-being. 
bolstering their economic sufficiency by furthering their education and developing new skills for employment. They also discuss accessing formal resources for support in their communities. So what do we need to do to support black women survivors of violence? Well, I think that promoting SPLACE, this idea of ensuring that geographic locations are welcoming and that women, black women, can find meaning and a sense of belonging in those places could be a first step. And we know that black women are magic. Black women lead. Black women rock. And we have historical models in, for example, Dr. Turborg Penn, who pushed the boundaries of the geographies of black women through her foundational texts, her innovative activism, and mentorship of multiple generations of black women historians. She challenged the received historical view of black women's invisibility. Dr. Turborg Penn was a splace creator. This Women's History Month theme of providing healing, promoting hope, should, in, should motivate the urgent need that we have as a society to create splaces for black women survivors of intimate partner violence. The core of our safety and well-being rests on the expansion of black women's geographies to find, cultivate, and celebrate where we belong. Gender-based violence is an enormous burden on our society as a whole and requires thoughtful consideration of space-based solutions that can attend to black women's unique stories of trauma and healing. We can advance policies. We can advocate for our neighborhoods. We should insist that our leaders develop safety as a norm for our children, our families, and ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Alexander. We now have a chance for questions from the audience, and I will gladly start it off. If anyone else is interested, they can get in line behind me. But I would like to thank you for, for your conversation about the idea of splace and geography. So when you look at the demographic you've studied, how does this 25 to 15 young women, do they factor into this community of your study as well? And if they're seeing such abused models, do they replicate that behavior? And then how can we intervene so it doesn't replicate itself for another generation? Thank you for the question, Dr. Jones. Yes, so we do know that much, many of the violent experiences that black women in, experience are, do, do occur before the ages of 25. And so what is occurring, unfortunately, in our society and our communities are models of unhealthy behaviors, unhealthy relationships. And so there, there have certainly been movements in violence prevention. Um, it's, it, this, is the atten this has the attention of the Centers for Disease Control. There are numerous um, uh, curricula that are being implemented in schools. We're now realizing that we have to start early. We have to start when young people are becoming interested in loving relationships and teaching them how to um, model consent, how to be respectful of one another and boundaries that can exist. And, piggy for, and, and incorporating the idea of space would also include incorporating ideas of respect and consent outside of these interpersonal relationships. So respect for community is also respect for um, having an, a, a positive interpersonal relationship. Healthy relationships with an, a, a manager or employer or person that's outside of your family but is, um, is an influential person in, in your life can also model how to, how to be 
um, helpful and healthy in a, in a relationship that will be long-lasting. Okay. Um, I appreciate you for such a remarkable presentation. I have a question. So my minor is in um, women and gender studies, but I want to find out, is place a concept or a theory? Because I am approaching the stage where I have to write my dissertation, and I'm trying to find a very unique concept to um, analyze the text that I elect to use. And watching you um, talk about place, I think um, that that's new, and we're going to try to see how we can incorporate that in our research, especially in the academia and in the Department of English. I just want to find out, because I know that um, gender-based domestic violence is a global issue, and especially amongst um, Africana women, aside African-American women, also that concept can be um, translated in other texts for um, women in the diaspora, African women in the diaspora. So I just want to find out, is, is there a developed um, you know, document that I can refer to or and also encourage my classmates to do so too? Thank you for the question. So I, I would um, encourage you to um, check out the, the subfield of black geographies. Um, so there's, there are many emerging um, um, scholars who are analyzing um, how uh, geography, or the, the, how black individuals are living in and disrupting um, what traditional geographies are. Um, but Catherine McKittrick is the one, is the social theorist and geographer. Her 2006 book is um, called Demonic Grounds, um, The Cartographies of Struggle. And I would, I would urge you to you know, probably start there. Um, and then she has a new book um, that's called Dear Science, where, which is more essays. Um, but I think from there, you'll start seeing quite a bit of um, citations of other scholars that have been looking at this, this concept. And one last question before we close. I would, looking at Larry Brown's work, The Black Butterfly, mm -hmm. and you being a public health nurse, it sounds very much you can overlay gender to his ideas of these black wings in this white L. Could you explain a bit about that? Are you looking to work or collaborate with him? Because Baltimore is kind of one of the last black cities besides Chicago. Um, and so as a result, there's actually some kind of measured attack on these urban spaces and kind of imploding. So could you give us any insight about how gender should be factored into Larry Brown's, Dr. Brown's theory on the black butterfly? Wow, that's a really interesting thought. And I had not, so as I've been conducting this study, I have not, um, I have been using, you know, Dr. Brown's work as kind of a foundational way of understanding how women are talking about how they, tr they move around the city. Um, but I hadn't thought about um, actually collaborating with him. Um, but I, you know, and, but I do think it's an, it's, it's a very interesting uh, what, way to think about how to, to overlay what he's already um, started and kind of expand his, his thoughts about um, that concept. I also am, interested in um, multiple marginalized identities. So I think while gender is, is certainly an um, entree to looking at how, these, how spaces and places are, are um, disruptive and can be analyzed in different ways, um, queerness or being LGBTQ um, also has a really uh, um, important uh, and, and way of analysis that can, can that can assist us to understand how people are 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 really kind of showing up in places that we are living. Good morning. I'm Phyllis Keys from the Office of the Provost. I'm the Interim Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs, and I would like to make a presentation to Dr. Alexander for her speaking today. On behalf of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Morgan State University, we proudly recognize Dr. Camilla A. Alexander for presenting the keynote address at the March 24, 2022, Turberg Penn Women's History Month Convocation. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Thank you so much. So I would like to, again, thank Dr. Alexander for presenting with us. 
I would also like to thank Dr. Jones and Dr. Newsom-Hurst, as well as all of the other participants who made this program successful today. And last, I would like to thank those who came out in person and those who are watching us virtually for the Women's History Month Convocation. I want to thank you for helping us to celebrate the achievement of women and also acknowledge the challenges that we face in society today. Thank you.